This is actually a very long way to walk to just to get on stage. Um, so I don't know about you, I'm still uh, fascinated by Tejas' talk. Um, I want to go home and try all these things myself. Um, but uh, I guess I have to do this first. Um, so I'm going to be talking about something called web monetization. Um, it's a proposed new standard um, that should hopefully make it easier for uh, creators, developers, etc., to make money on the web. Um, but before I get into that, I want to briefly introduce who I am. Uh, so I'm a web developer for as long as I can remember. Um, this is a fairly old photo, but as you can see, I always wear very formal things. Um, and I'm also never far away from a computer because that's sort of been my, my passion. Uh, and uh, it, you know, I treated computers well and computers have treated me well. I, I have, I've been very fortunate. Um, and I think I was very lucky because I grew up in a household where I had access to a computer um, and I had fairly early access to an internet connection. Um, and so there's a lot of things I'm grateful for. But uh, one thing in particular is that there were a lot of really smart um, and really, really dedicated people that built something called the web um, and a lot of the underlying technologies that enable that. Um, and that's really what's enabled me to, um, to be successful and build a career. Um, and this is the very first website that I, uh, I made commercially. Um, I got paid in a packet of Magic the Gathering cards. Um, it hasn't aged particularly well, um, but I was amazed to find that it is still online today. Um, the Flash logo doesn't show up anymore, and um, frames aren't really in fashion um, today, but you know, it still works. And um, as Tim Berners-Lee says, cool URLs don't change. So um, I'm glad that's, that thing's still online. Maybe I'll, I'll give them a free you know, redesign. <clears throat> but uh, the, the thing that I want to talk about is, um, you know, if I'm making a website today, let's say I'm really excited about um, you know, whatever um, topic, blog, or whatever, um, it's very easy for me to put my content out there. Anyone can do it. Anyone can go rent some server space or even get free server space and put some content out there or I can upload it to any number of platforms. But if I want to actually make money, um, I have to go and work with one of the large tech companies or some really large content platform. Um, it's very difficult for me to, to go completely independent if I, if I want to actually uh, make a living off of my work. It's not impossible, of course, but um, it is definitely very difficult. And I think what makes it difficult is that there isn't anything native in the web that allows me to make money. Um, it's always like something tacked on. And I'll, I'll kind of illustrate what I mean. So let's say I, I want to make a blog about honey badgers, because I'm just so fascinated with honey badgers. They're the most fascinating animal to me. And so I have made a great website, and it explains everything that you need to know. Um, and, and actually, you know, people really dig my website. Um, and so the traffic's going through the roof, and uh, suddenly Amazon's starting to send me uh, these bills with uh, increasingly large numbers. Um, so, you know, every month I get something like this, and it's like, oh, shoot, this is starting to be expensive. Um, and so now I'm thinking about, well, maybe I can make some money off the website. Um, and so the first thing that a lot of us turn to when we want to monetize our websites is advertising. Uh, and so before I know it, my website looks like this. Okay, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, okay. Um, maybe you can find some less obtrusive ads. Um, but there's still issues with ads. Even the ones that are just textual, um, there's a lot of tracking that goes on. They uh, add a lot of external scripts that I have to include in my page. Uh, it drains the user's battery, it um, uses up their bandwidth. Uh, there was an article I read where um, they looked at uh, how much bandwidth the ads take and how much money the publisher makes off of the ad. And they noticed that in a lot of cases, the user is paying more for the bandwidth to load the ad than the publisher is making from showing the ad, um, which seems like there's some, some room for improvement. Um, now, of course, you might say, like, OK, well, ads are kind of an old hat anyway. Um, today, um, a lot of people are starting to use ad blockers because of all these problems, because they want to protect their privacy. Um, and so we're kind of starting to move more towards like subscription models. So everyone, their grandmother's coming out with a subscription right now. Everyone from Disney to um, you know your neighborhood blog um, is now having a subscription. A lot of independent creators are having subscriptions through Patreon and YouTube and Twitch and other platforms like that. Um, and that's all great, but I think that at some point that gets very overwhelming for the user. Like um, I don't know about you, but I, I go to you know 
consume content from probably 100 different people, maybe even more, um, every month. And so um, am I really going to have 100 different subscriptions to support all of them? You know, probably not. Um, just subscribing and unsubscribing all the time would be um, a, a huge headache. And so maybe subscriptions aren't the perfect solution either. Um, and it seems like people uh, feel that way. Like this is from a, a study um, where they basically looked at, you know, how many people um, are actually starting to be overwhelmed by the number of subscriptions. And keep in mind that this survey was before a lot of these other subscriptions like Disney Plus and others are, even came out. So, you know, if we kind of take a step back and we look at the problem, it's like, what is really going on here? Like, why does monetization seem so difficult? Why does it seem so broken? Why isn't it just more seamless? And I think it boils down to a very simple thing, which is the way that we do monetization is always out of band. It's always roundabout. Um, there isn't anything built into the web. It's just we've, we've, you know, we're building some ads um, and layering them on top of our website, or maybe we use some traditional payment method that, that to pay a subscription. But there isn't something that's sort of natively built into the web, like really something that looks more like this, where um, I get the content and I pay you some money, and both is going through open protocols, uh, both is going through uh, interoperable protocols that are sort of universal and globally accepted um, and, and neutral. Um, and so there's nobody in the middle that necessarily is taking any, any cut. It's just sort of going straight through. And, uh, you know, well, you might ask, like, why aren't we using that? Um, and the first thing is that it's not that people didn't think of this. It's not like people didn't realize that this would be a nice thing to have for the web. Um, if you look at the HTTP spec, this is one of my favorite examples, um, they actually reserved an error code for payment required, and underneath it says, this is reserved for future use. As soon as we figure out this micropayments thing, well, we'll define it. And it's been 30 years, and of course, it's still not defined. Um, and so I'm kind of, again, like, why, why, why is it so hard? And so um, about five years ago, um, myself and a bunch of other people that, that you know, were interested in this topic, um, we started a community group at the W3C. Um, it kind of came out of the web payments work, um, which you may be familiar if you're following um, sort of payment standards on, on, in browsers. And uh, we started to think about like protocols for, um, for, for payments and particularly you know, really solving it from a fundamental level because it just making a nice abstraction of the PayPal API is probably not going to cut it. You know, like you're going to have to have something that, you know, fundamentally changes how, how payments move, the same way the internet changed how, how data moves. And so we started working on this project called Interledger, and the name is based on the idea that um, the same way the internet abstracts, you know, which specific communications network you're using, um, allowing you to use any of them, uh, even create your own if you want, and use it locally in your, in your local network, um, we wanted something that allows you to use whatever payment system you want and still um, transact with people all over the world that might be using very different systems. Um, I was working in the blockchain space for a long time, and so there are countries where uh, cryptocurrency is um, banned, and so they can't use any cryptocurrency. And then there are countries where um, the existing payment systems and the existing currencies have such high inflation that people don't want to use it, and they actually turn to something like cryptocurrency. And very quickly, I realized um, that, you know, you can't have one system that is going to satisfy everybody in the world. And uh, the elegance of the Internet is that you don't have to, right? Like, I can have my Wi-Fi and you can have your Ethernet, um, and we can still have a Skype call, right? Um, but nothing like that exists in payments. In payments, if I'm on PayPal and you're on WeChat Pay, like, you yeah, you're going to have a difficult time. Um, and so, yeah, we started working on this problem. Um, we actually started out thinking that it would be quite different than the internet and we just wanted to have some, some very basic similarities like the idea that you have different people that appeared, um, that unlike a blockchain, you would have no global state. Um, I think in a blockchain, a big problem is that everyone has to have that global state um, and that makes it, again, like a very complex system to agree on um, and also a very difficult system to scale and upgrade. So we, re we realized it wasn't going to be a blockchain, it was going to be more something like the internet. Um, but we didn't realize just how many of the concepts that make the internet so powerful were actually applicable to this um, problem. And I'll give you just one example. So for a while we were trying to figure out um, how does 
uh, a large payment go through the network versus a very small payment. And just to give you a sense of this, the differences in sizes, um, you know, we wanted to make some of these content uh, payment use cases, like you're reading an article, you probably don't want to pay more than a few cents. Um, and on the other end of the, the other extreme, um, at the time I was working for a company called Ripple, where we worked with banks, and I had a conversation with uh, somebody at a large bank, and I asked them, like, you know, what do you consider a micropayment? Because maybe we're talking past each other a little bit when I talk about micropayments, and, and you know, I got that sense. And uh, they said, a micropayment is anything under $10,000. And I was like, okay, we are, we are talking past each other. That's not what I mean. Um, and so you kind of have this insane range. So you have um, you know, banks that are moving $10 million payments, and then you have people that are trying to send three cents. And um, what you quickly realize is that it's very hard to design a protocol that can handle both. Um, and that's in some way similar to how the internet, if it was designed for highly variable packet sizes, that would have a, a huge number of very bad implications. Like if you if you're sending a two gigabyte you know, IP packet and that gets lost and you have to resend the whole thing, that would be terrible, you know, it would be very bad. Um, and so we started to think about like, well, well, maybe we could do something similar for payments where if we have a larger payment, we just split it into lots of small packets and as long as we can route all the individual packets to the destination, they can just sort of assemble it and then until they get to the right amount. Um, we even uh, kind of copied the um, the layered architecture of the internet. So the internet has these like different layers um, and there's kind of two models. There's the internet model itself, which is actually less known. And then there's the OSI model, which has a, um, a few more layers. Um, I'm using the more simplified internet model. Um, but basically you have the, your internet protocol in the middle and our equivalent is called the interledger protocol. And that's just sort of a format for individual packets of money. How do you express a packet of money? How does it um, move through the system, etc. Uh, this is also where you would have a routing protocol. Um, the interledger routing protocol is very similar to the internet routing protocol, BGP. And so, um, you know, yeah, you're just basically moving these packets around. Um, and then above that, um, you have kind of two layers. One is the application layer, which is pretty self-explanatory. This is like for different applications. You need different um, interfaces. And so um, you kind of optimize for your application on the application layer. And that's where you get things like HTTP for the web and SMTP for email and so on. Um, and in Interledger, we, we currently only have one application layer protocol, which is the first one, which is, you know, kind of think of it as like a HTTP equivalent, where it's like it's sort of a general purpose moving money around kind of application layer protocol. Um, it actually uses HTTPS for a lot of the security stuff to identify who you're paying and things like that. Um, and then the next layer down is the transport protocol, and on the internet, in the internet world, that would be your TCP or something, or UDP. Um, and in the case of TCP, what it really does is it handles retransmissions, retries, flow control, like you don't want to send packets too fast so they don't actually get through, they just get buffered and stuck. Um, and so, uh, yeah, based on the similarities on the um, interoperability layer, uh, we actually needed a very similar transport layer because we also needed to resend packets that failed and things like that. Um, and then underneath the interledger layer, well, you know, we can send these packets all day, but no actual money has moved. So we have to, you know, I don't want to say physically, but we have to, like, really move money. Um, and so this is where you want to tie into existing payment systems, right? So maybe um, I have a bank account, and I want to do Interledger with my bank account, so I need, a, um, I need to use a settlement mechanism, which is a bank transfer. Or if you're into cryptocurrency, you want to use that. And so um, that's where you have these different implementations of how money actually physically moves. Um, and so that's kind of how the architecture is structured. Um, and what's nice about this is, is it achieves that goal that I mentioned at the beginning, where I can, as a developer, write an application at the very top layer, um, which um, just says, hey, move some money from this person to this person, um, and I don't have to worry if what people are using, if they are using a bank account or a mobile money account or, um, or a crypto account. Um, and even like a future new payment systems could tie into this, and so you kind of you open it up for a lot of innovation. If someone can come up with a better payment system, they don't have to worry about you know, getting a million merchants and a hundred million cardholders before the, the system becomes even useful, but rather they can deploy it locally, hook it into Interledger, um, and immediately have a very useful solution. And so just to kind of convince you that this is actually real, um, so I started a company last year after we kind of got to a point where Interledger was pretty uh, robust, we thought. 
um, but it wasn't really used in practice. It was only in the lab. Um, and so since we started the company last year, we've already made um, 100 billion payments. Now, these are individual Interledger packets. And it's kind of, you have to think of it like, um, you know, the difference of going from a fax machine to the internet, where like, you know, credit cards, you're making very few payments, uh, relatively speaking. With something like Interledger, you're making a lot of payments even per user. Um, and so it's, it's literally orders of magnitude uh, more payments that you can make because it's so efficient at sending very small payments and because um, when you're trying to send a large amount of money, it actually might split it up into lots of small payments. So um, it really feels like, it's, like there's an analogy here. Now, I'm not talking about Interledger itself today. I'm talking about web monetization. Um, so web monetization is, uh, as I said, a proposed web standard. And uh, what, it, what it does is it essentially uses Interledger as infrastructure. So Interledger allows us to send these like, very small amounts of money very efficiently. And it creates a browser interface for it, um, which essentially allows a, um, a user that's browsing the web to pay all the websites that they're visiting. Um, and it's, um, you know, in the way that it's implemented right now, it's literally like every second you spend on the website, it sends another very small payment, a hundredth of a cent. Um, and so over time, that adds up. And so right now, um, if you go by the hundredth of a cent number, um, that's 36 cents per hour. Um, and that actually is right in the range of what you would make with under other monetization options. Um, and some people make a little bit more, like video sites, like YouTube, uh, make a little bit more. Um, but others make a lot less. So for example, podcasts, uh, we saw a number from Nielsen where podcasts are making around one cent per user hour. So for them, it's like 36 times more money than they would be making off of a, a user ordinarily. Um, and so what you're seeing here is a screenshot of a browser called Puma. Puma is a browser for iOS and Android. Um, it's a fork of Firefox, um, and it builds uh, web monetization natively into the browser. And so um, one of the features that they have that's really neat if you're first trying it out is it adds a little counter in the bottom left. It's probably a little bit small to see, but it, it shows you in real time as you're paying the website that counter ticks up, um, which is really cool. And a lot of people look at that and say, wow. Um, and so from the website's perspective, of course, if, if, you, if one user is paying you you know, two cents, um, and of course right now there aren't that many users who are web monetized, um, you're probably not going to make a lot. Um, but if this becomes more widely adopted, um, you could quickly see how that, that those numbers start to add up. Um, and as you have more and more user hours, you might make a decent amount of money. Um, and what makes this make sense, especially for um, the not the not the biggest size, like everyone else, the rest of us, um, is that it's totally linear, right? Like you don't get more money just because you have more traffic the way you do with ads because you have more buying power and you have more, uh, you have more data on users and things like that. Um, or the way it works with subscriptions where um, if I have a huge content platform, way more people will sign up um, and I will have much better conversion rates um, than if I have a small site where there isn't much content behind my subscription. And so this is really linear, right? Like if I have a small website, I'll just get proportionally less um, rather than getting a lot less. So right now there is uh, extensions uh, from Coil for um, uh, Firefox and Chrome, and there's one browser that implements it natively, Puma. Um, two weeks ago we were at TPAC and we had a lot of really good conversations with browser vendors, um, and so uh, I expect there will be a few more, um, several uh, browser vendors kind of reached out to us saying like, hey, we actually seriously want to implement this. Um, a lot of people recognize that monetization is a big issue, um, and so uh, there's a lot of um, willingness to experiment. Um, same thing on the publisher side, so um, there's a few early adopters who are playing around with this technology. Um, one of them is Chris Coy over at CSS Tricks. Um, you can see what he's saying up there. Um, but it's definitely the kind of thing where like, you know, you um, very easily can integrate it into your site, um, and you're probably not going to get rich today, <laughs> but um, it, it, it has that sort of magical feel of, like, I can um, monetize directly from my users. I don't need to necessarily show them any ads. I don't need to um, you know, build a whole registration system and let them sign up and all these kinds of things. I can just put this, like, one little tag on my page, um, and now I can get paid. Um, so how do you actually um, adopt web monetization as a web developer? So the first step is you need to be able to receive Interledger payments, right? So all, these, uh, all this money is moving as Interledger packets, and so you need those packets to be received somewhere. It's kind of like if you want to make a website, you need a server that's on the Internet. 
Um, and so that would be your step one. Um, and then the second step is you need to add the web monetization tag to your website. And that's uh, essentially just a meta tag that um, tells browsers, well, okay, if you want to support this website, here's where you can send money. Um, and then, of course, there's a third thing you can do if you want. You don't have to. Um, but that's where you actually can reward a user that is paying and give them a slightly different user experience versus a user that isn't paying. Um, examples of that would be um, turning off the ads, or maybe you give them some extra features, or um, you know, some bonus content, or whatever you want. You can even show a little thank you banner. Um, so regarding the first step, where can you get an IntelliJ wallet? So right now there are three um, uh, wallets that support IntelliJ. Um, and again, keep in mind, we just uh, we launched our open beta in May, so hopefully there'll be a lot more soon, but these are the ones that are there right now as I'm giving this talk. Um, GitHub actually just launched today, so if I had given the talk yesterday, it would be two. <laughs> so um, we think that there's, there's um, going to be a lot more, um, but the ones that we have actually cover a lot of ground already. Uh, so Stronghold is a US-based provider, so you can withdraw to a US bank account very easily. Uh, you can also withdraw via international bank wire, um, and the money accumulates in dollars. Uh, GateHub covers the European region pretty well, so if you have a European bank account, um, you might want to look into GateHub. Um, and then XRP Tipbot is a crypto wallet, so you can actually withdraw into crypto if you want. Um, so then the next step is you have your wallet, um, and one of the things that you get from your wallet provider is called a payment pointer. Um, and it's that little thing with the dollar sign. Um, it's actually just an HTTPS URL. Um, the dollar sign is just used to make it kind of more recognizable as something that's related to uh, IntelliJ. Um, and so you can think of it as sort of like an email address for money, right? So it's a, it's a place that someone can send you IntelliJ payments. Um, and payment pointers are actually referenced by the SPSP standard, which is that application layer protocol that I mentioned previously. Um, and so all the meta tag really says is like, hey, this website monetizes with this wallet. So if you want to donate or if you want to send that website a monthly uh, donation or if you want to support it in real time the way that we do it at Coil, um, here's where you can send money. Um, and that's really, uh, that's really all that MetaTag says. Um, and of course, you may want to reward the user. Um, and so what that means is like if the user is paying in real time, um, you are getting money, and so you could say like, hey, I want to have a slightly different user experience for users that are actively supporting me. Um, and why would you do that? Well, because um, that might encourage more users to sign up for web monetization. Um, and also, um, providers like Coil, we may pay more if we know that a certain site is giving benefits. Um, so that's kind of our way of incentivizing web developers to say, hey, we want to give benefits for web monetized users. Um, if you think this sort of through to the logical conclusion, you could imagine it as almost like a, an open source um, Amazon Prime um, that, that works on the whole web as opposed to just on Amazon-owned websites. Um, so I get one subscription, I can choose from a variety of providers, um, and any of them give me the same feature, which is I can go to any website, I'm supporting the website, and the website's giving me a premium experience that might not involve ads, it might protect my privacy better because of that, um, and it's not going to ask me to pay or get on a subscription. Um, and so yeah, there's a simple JavaScript API if you want to just listen for the browser uh, telling you that it's paying. Um, but of course, people can install an extension or just in any way modify the browser to simulate those events. So this is not a secure way of doing it. Um, and so we recommend this way if you're just testing it, if you're just trying it out, um, or if you're, you know, the benefits that you're giving aren't like hugely valuable or you don't care if people can, can cheat. Um, so an example would be if you show a thank you banner or something like that, you know, yeah, people can cheat and get the thank you banner, but, you know, who's going to do that? That's, you know, feels empty at that point if you're getting a thank you for something you didn't do. Um, so it depends really on the use case. I think ads are another good example. If you want to turn off ads, you can probably rely, rely just on the JavaScript because, um, you know, people can already block your ads anyway. Um, but let's say you want to have this, like, let's say you're Netflix and you want to give people access to a huge content library. You probably want to make sure that you're actually getting paid. Um, and so there's a way to do that. Uh, which is, um, first step, the user goes to the website, um, so that's the same. Um, and so now you're serving that meta tag. And now the user's browser is actually starting to send money to your IntelliJ wallet. Um, and so the idea is that that wallet could then issue a JSON web token or some other um, cryptographically signed token that says, okay, this user has paid this much. 
Um, and now that could be shipped back to the browser. And now the browser can use that to retrieve um, premium content from a CDN or something like that. Um, and there's lots of ways to optimize this and make this more streamlined. Um, but there is an implementation of it, and there's already a couple of sites using it. Um, uh, one site called Cinnamon is sort of like a uh, YouTube slash uh, Netflix um, for web monetization, so you never see any ads. You get um, you know, premium quality content, um, but you can also upload your own content. Um, and yeah, uh, it uses this, this kind of scheme. Um, so if you want to know how that works, you can go to that URL. Now, of course, the big problem with any ecosystem, whether it's open or not, is you have to somehow get it started. Um, when you first start out, there's no users, there's no content, so why would a content creator sign up? Why would a user sign up? Um, and so we looked at that problem, and you know, as a company, like we could have built a proprietary system, um, but we feel like there's already plenty of those out there, and um, they have way more funding than we have. They, I think Netflix inv invests something like $15 billion a year in, in just content. Um, and so obviously we can't compete with that. Um, but we think that if we invest enough uh, so that um, it's, it's, it's worth it for some uh, developers who might be, or, or also content creators, who might be sympathetic to the idea of um, creating a better world for, um, for content in the future, um, they might be, you know, we might be able to convince them. Um, and so we took some of the money that we raised uh, to build the company, uh, and we partner with Mozilla and Creative Commons to give that money away to anybody who adopts the standard. Um, and what we hope this will do is um, create enough of an initial content base um, to make it worthwhile for some early adopters to sign up on the user side. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, the way the grant works is uh, each of the three founding members, we all have a representative on an advisory council, um, and they vote on anything related to how the grant should be used. Um, and then we have a forum at forum.grantfortheweb.org um, where we are interacting with the community to figure out what are some of the grant uh, proposals that uh, we should put out. Um, and so, yeah, if you're interested in a grant for the web, uh, definitely check that out. Uh, it's $100 million that we're giving away, so um, it's, it's probably worth your time. Um, and so, yeah, that's pretty much it for me. Um, uh, if you want to learn more about this stuff, so my company is called Coil. Um, we're at coil.com. You can also follow us on Twitter under at Coil. Um, that's sort of the commercial side. That's where um, we're trying to compete with other providers. We're trying to provide the best um, experience. We're trying to protect privacy better than other providers. Um, and we're trying to kind of yeah, make it as easy as possible for people to adopt and use web monetization. Um, Grant for the Web is, like I said, a partnership. Um, and we're actually looking for um, adding other nonprofits that can cover you know, specific topics, specific subject areas. So, um, for example, if we wanted to do something around journalism, we'd want to uh, partner with somebody that um, has a lot of experience with that area. Um, and so, um, you know, that's why, why we, we're keeping it an open um, project. Um, so if you want to know more about the grant, if you want to know how to apply, things like that, um, there's also a public charter where you can see what are sort of the, um, the rules around the grant and how it's set up. Um, you can find all of that on grantfortheweb.org. Um, and if you want to stay up to date with um, the activities around the grant, there's a, uh, a place you can sign up with your email address where you will get any kind of uh, calls for proposals that go out. Um, and also you can follow them on uh, Twitter as well. And then finally, if you're interested in web monetization as a standard, um, you can go to webmonetization.org. Um, it's pretty bare bones right now, but we are building um, you know, more resources like a, a way to generate the meta tag very easily, um, a way to find wallets to sign up to and things like that. Um, the whole site is on GitHub, so if you want to make any changes or improvements to webmonetization.org, those are very welcome. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you.